said good evening. I got it right. I'm used to saying good morning. Uh, how many of you were here this morning for session number one? Oh, great. And I forgot to ask this question for Brian's sake. How many of you have been to the Ark before out in Kentucky? Look at that. A lot of great uh, customers here. I'm going to open us in prayer, then tonight we'll have session two. It'll just be one hour, and then Brian will be around to answer questions. He said he got a lot of good questions this morning. And then tomorrow night are the fireworks. You don't want to miss tomorrow night. In the bulletin this morning, we had the schedule. There was only going to be one session tomorrow, but Brian has agreed to give us a bonus section on CRT and social justice issues. So tomorrow we'll start at 6, we'll end at 7, take a short break. We'll pick back up after the break and end around 8.15. But for tonight, we have one one-hour session, and I'm going to open us in prayer and pass it off to Brian Osborne. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we saw this morning the paramount importance of the authority of the word of God in our lives and how the, the authority is being compromised all throughout society. Lord, as your people, let us be Bible people, people who stand the authority of the word of God and give us great answers uh, to questions that friends have tonight as we learn apologetics and defending our faith. Pray a blessing on Brian here, Mr. Osborne, as he shares with us all that he's learned over the years. And let us just soak it up like uh, sponges, Lord. And we pray all this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I do think I got it turned on. This is on here. Are we good here? Hear me okay? Some are nodding no, some are nodding. Good to go there. All right. How about this? Is that good? There we go. Hey, give Austin a hand. That's a lot of running. All right. <laughs> this does mean I can't walk around, though. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. I'm stuck right here now. All right. Well, guys, it's a blessing to be here with you again. My name is Brian Osborne. I am from Answers in Genesis. A lot of you are here this morning. If you weren't here, glad you're here. Uh, just a brief introduction to kind of who we are and kind of who I am. And first, uh, first, understand that our ministry is a biblical authority ministry. We're equipping Christians to defend their faith, not simply just to give answers, but to defend the faith to proclaim the gospel effectively. That's our heartbeat. That's the heartbeat behind that drives everything that we do. Whether we're talking about the Creation Museum, resources, books, DVDs, York Encounter, that's our heartbeat. So keep a hold of that as we go through all the different answers. Whether we're talking about the age of the earth tonight, which is somewhat controversial, or one blood, one race, and critical race theory tomorrow night, the heartbeat behind all these things is to defend biblical authority and proclaim the gospel effectively. So keep that in mind. In case you weren't here, I got to show you this picture. And again, we could be here all night with me showing pictures of my family, all right? Uh, but uh, again, that's my wife, Marla, of 24 years this past June. People say, that's impossible. You guys can't be that old. She doesn't look that old. I say, we married when we were 12, and I just go with that, all right? <laughs> my daughter, Macy, who is four. My son, Ian, who is eight. And uh, it is just, I'm so blessed. And I'm really just showing God's greatest earthly blessings giving to me. And that's why I'm just showing you here with that. And I could be here all day on that, but I'll move on. And I was a teacher. I taught for Bible, I taught for 13 years. I taught Bible history in a public school over in Hickson, Tennessee. And then joined the ministry of Answers in Genesis a little over eight and a half years ago. And since that point in time, I have been traveling literally around the world and uh, just preaching the truth about God's word, giving people apologetics to defend the faith, challenging non-believers. And it's been amazing to watch what God has done for his glory and all this. And he's doing, still doing many great things through our ministry. It's so just a privilege to be a part of that. In case you're not as familiar with us, some of you raised your hands already. We have the Creation Museum. Who's been to the Creation Museum? So I can see from up here. A lot of you have very good, all right. And who's been to the Ark Encounter? And then who's been the neither? There's time to repent. That's okay. All right, you can. 
<laughs> Amen, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you have not been, the Creche Museum is at 75,000, a square foot walk through biblical history. You see some of the video behind me. Beautiful botanical garden, gardens, especially this time of year. There's an amazing playground for the kids. There's a zoo, kind of a petting zoo. The planetarium is unbelievable. The show created Cosmos is awesome. The walk through, the exhibits, the sculpting, the writing, there are shows every day, live speakers workshops, special effects theater. You can spend a good two days at the Creation Museum to be sure. And so if you ever get a chance to go, Northern Kentucky, I know it's a bit of a trip from here, but it is worth it. I will guarantee you that. And then also we're the ministry that built the Ark Encounter. So just in case you weren't here this morning, we built that life-size replica of Noah's Ark. And again, the point of that is not simply to draw people to it. Yes, we want to draw people to this attraction for sure, but we're drawing them there to hear a message that the Bible is true. Its history is true. What it says about morality and sexuality is true. What the Bible says about salvation through Christ alone is true because the Bible is the Word of God and God gets everything right. And so we're giving answers, defending the faith, proclaiming the truth in an amazing way. And at the Ark Encounter, you've got gardens there as well. You have a great zoo that's expanding all the time. You've got a virtual reality ride, a brand new carousel, new stuff coming all the time. And so we are really growing as a ministry by God's grace. And so uh, if you want to be a part of that, we'll talk more about that later on. But it's been a privilege to watch God work these last eight years in my life and in this ministry. And then this talk tonight on the age of the earth. And you see the subtitle there. And that's really the key of this talk. In whose word do you trust? And that is what it will come down to. And we'll see that kind of fleshed out as we go through. And as I said this morning, really, and I mentioned already tonight, our passion behind this is biblical authority, defending biblical authority from the beginning and the gospel rooted in that authority. That's why we care so much about this. Let me tell you something. If this was simply about winning a debate about radiometric dating, I'm out. That's boring, sounds awful to me, right? But when defending biblical authority and the attack on God's word at the beginning, that's what matters in the gospel in that authority. That's what we give answers about radiometric dating and distant starlight. We'll see more of those answers later on tonight. So we care because it's a biblical authority issue. But why do the secularists care? And let me tell you something, the evolutionists, the secularists are zealous, religiously so, for this idea of long periods of time. Why do they care so much? Well, I'm sure there are many reasons, but I think one of the primary reasons is this, is that in order for evolutionism to be true, you've got to believe some pretty unscientific things. You got to get everything from nothing. You got to get life from non-life, information from non-living, non-thinking matter. You must get order from disorder, order out of chaos, and so forth and so on. All those things that are on the screen go against known laws of science, but must be true for evolution to be true. So if you still want to believe in evolution and still be quote unquote scientific, then who or what is the hero to save your evolutionary theory from all this contrary evidence? And for the most part, for them, it is time. Time is their hero. And I suggest that's one of the main reasons they're so zealous for this particular idea. George Wald, a famous American biochemist, said it like this, that time is in fact the hero of the plot. He's talking about evolution. What we regard as the impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One only has to wait, and time itself performs the what? Miracles. So glad he used that word, and that's what they need to save their naturalistic theory. But it's kind of funny when you think about it. I mean, Compare it to the story of the woman who kissed the frog and got the prince. Remember that? Doesn't happen in often, doesn't happen that often in real life. I mean, how many of you ladies in here got your husband by kissing a frog? Anybody? One, two, three. Okay, three. Very good. No, it doesn't happen in real life, of course, but according to evolutionary thinking, it should be a rather common occurrence because in evolutionary ideology, life came from non-life, and then life evolved into something like into the amoeba, which evolved into something like the frog, which eventually evolved into the prince. It's the same fairy tale. Well, the key difference, here's the key difference. If the frog turns into the handsome prince very quickly, well, we know that is silly. That would be a fairy tale. That's made up. But if the frog turns into the handsome prince very slowly, that is modern secular science. 
A difference, the difference, a super duper magical ingredient called millions of years. Time is their hero. I suggest this is primarily why they're so zealous for this particular idea and it's rammed down our throat from every angle in our society today. So much time are we talking about here? According to secular thinking, the Earth is roughly four and a half billion years old. Universe is roughly 14 billion years old, at least that's today's estimates. Those change a lot, by the way, over time. But what if we do something radical, like we mentioned Jesus doing this morning? What if we trust God's word? Well, if we trust, think about it this way, the eyewitness account of the creator himself. If we do that, the plain straightforward reading of the biblical text is that God made everything in six days, roughly 6,000 years ago. Now some say, okay, but where do you get that number 6,000 from? I mean, the Bible doesn't explicitly say the earth is 6,000 years old. And of course it does not, but it does something better. It gives us a birth certificate of sorts, a way to calculate the earth's age based on the information in the Bible. In particular, we are talking about those biblical family trees in the Bible, especially Genesis 5 and 11, those genealogies. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. Those scenes you love to read at night if you're trying to go to sleep, right? Just knock you out. And nobody can pronounce all the names. Don't worry about that. But in some of those family trees, it gives you the age of, this fa of, the, of the father when the kid is born. And then the kid's age when his kid is born. And you can go down the line, add those ages up, it's general math, to get a good estimate for the age of the earth. So doing that, we know from Adam to Abraham is roughly 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus, 2,000 years. From Jesus to today, roughly 2,000 years. Put that all together, God made everything around 6,000 years ago. Or put another way, God made it all around 4,000 B.C. Now, we don't think you can be exact and say 4,004 B.C. at 8 o'clock in the morning, right? We do know that Adam was made in the afternoon because it was just before Eve, but other than that, you can't be dogmatic. <laughs> I stole that joke, but anyway, all right. Just making sure you're with me. And some would say, well, okay, but then how do you know those days in Genesis are regular 24-hour days like we now experience? How do you know that? And that's a good question. That is a fair question, and there's a good and biblical answer. In a word, the answer is exegesis. And this is how we're supposed to read the Bible, exegetically. This means to read out of. It means you read the text in its context, right? Because context determines meaning, which is a common function of language. So if we're going to read the text in context, then what does the word day, the Hebrew equivalent, which is yom, what does it mean in the context of Genesis chapter 1? Because the word day does have multiple meanings. Most words do, depending on context. That's not weird. We think about it like this. Look at this one sentence. Back in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across America during the day. You get the word day three times in one sentence. It means something different each time it's used, right? And you know it does based on the what? Context, right? Context determines meaning. Again, it's a common function of language, no matter what language you're talking about. So with that being said, here's the question. When does the context in the Old Testament always demand that the word day be interpreted, understood as a literal 24-hour day? Well, guys, anytime we see any one of these contextual clues in the Old Testament, it's always a literal 24-hour day. So anytime you see the word number, it's a company, or the word day, and it's accompanied by, the word, by a number, like on the first day or during the second day, happens over 400 times, it's always a literal 24-hour day. Anytime you see evening and morning together in a sentence with or without the word day, over 60 times total, always a literal 24-hour day. Anytime you see night with day, over 50 times, always a literal 24-hour day. So remember, anytime you see, see the word day, with just any one of those contextual clues, it's always a literal 24-hour day. So with that being said, then here's the question. Well, is the context in Genesis 1 clear or unclear based on understanding this? Well, remember this. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, days of creation. You ready? Verse 5. The darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Is that clear or unclear? 
It's really clear if we're being honest, right? Notice for every day of creation, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, for all six days of creation. And then the seventh day is called the seventh day. Again, a number attached to the word day. Guys, this is literally contextual overkill. It's like God knew we would struggle with this later on, and he was helping us out, all right? Multiple contextual clues, these are regular 24-hour days. And plus, on top of that, there are lots of really good Hebrew words that mean an indefinite period of time, which God could have used. If that's what he wanted to say, he used none of those. He used the word day based on the context, a literal 24-hour day. And then this idea is reaffirmed throughout Scripture. One example, Exodus 20, 11 says this, For in six days the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and how much? All that is in them in those six days. And by the way, this is from the Ten Commandments, which God wrote on a rock with his own finger. This is his own commentary on Genesis chapter 1. The text is really clear. I heard someone once say it like this, that when the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, lest you end up with nonsense. Which is a good thing to remember. And some will say, okay, but then wait a minute, Brian, if the text really is so clear, then how come so many Christians now for a long time, many Christians over multiple decades, even a couple centuries now, so many Christian leaders and pastors and seminary professors and Bible college professors and so forth won't take a stand and they'll actually say that it's not clear and they'll reinterpret it to try to put it in millions of years. Why do so many do that if it is so clear? And I'll suggest this because whether they realize it or not, here's the bottom line. They're trusting man's ideas over God's word. That's actually what it is at a fundamental, foundational level. And some would say, but Brian, I mean, haven't they proven scientifically that the earth is millions of years old? Therefore, don't we have to believe it? Have they proven the earth is millions of years old scientifically? The answer is no. Hear me. You cannot scientifically prove the earth is millions of years old because you cannot observe or repeat millions of years in a laboratory. All right? Age is more of a historical question as opposed to a scientific question. But to understand that, understand kind of what we're talking about here, we need to do something really important. And I cannot overstate how important it is to really grab a hold of this next section and really understand what we're talking about here. We have to define the word science and what we mean by science. And this is really helpful to clarify what's actually happening. So let's do that. The word science, it comes from two Latin words, means to know or to gain knowledge. And for most of us, when we think of the word science, we think of the scientific method. Right? A method we use to accumulate knowledge and then to manipulate our understanding of things to the benefit of humanity. All right? and so, but there are really two different distinct branches of this science that we can talk about. First one's going to be this, something you might call observational or operational science. And this is what most people think of when you say the word science. This is here and now science. This is observable, testable, repeatable, and falsifiable. This is someone in a laboratory mixing chemical A with chemical B. They get result C. They repeat the process, get the same results. They accumulate knowledge and use that knowledge to make all sorts of really cool stuff. Like satellites and medicine and laptops and cell phones and so forth and so on. And dear Christian or non-believer, hear me clearly. There's absolutely no conflict between the Bible and operational science. None at all. Actually, did you realize that science is only possible, get this, because the Bible is true. Think about it. The God of the Bible, he made, yes, the tangible world, that's true, but he also made the non-tangible world. God made the laws of nature, and he holds them to consistent to begin with. That's why you can do science in the first place. It's never science versus the Bible. It's always science because of the Bible. Only made sense within the biblical worldview. And by the way, dear friends, this is why most of your major branches of science were started by Bible believing Christians, most of whom believed in a young earth. Man, how radical. But see, this gets to the crux of the matter. That's operational science. But here's the crux operation does not explain origination. Origination is a different question. Pick anything you want in life. How does your car operate? How does a flashlight operate? How does your cell phone operate? How does this bottle of water operate? The way it functions does not explain how it originated. Origination is a different question. It's a historical question. 
And so this leads to a totally different branch of science, something you might call origins or historical science. And this is, hear me, so different than operational science. Why? Well, because in historical science, here's what you're doing. You're looking at stuff in the present, and you're trying to figure out what happened in the unseen past to bring about what it is you're looking at in the present. Because when you're trying to figure out what happened in the unseen past, here's the problem. The past is gone, right? History is not observable, testable, repeatable, or falsifiable which makes historical science a very different thing than operational science. So with historical science, you find clues in the present. You interpret those clues with assumptions about the past. And again, as we said this morning, here's the big key. If you start with the wrong assumptions, especially about unseen history from a human perspective, you'll likely get the wrong conclusions. And this is why some really, hear this word, brilliant secular scientists can be so wrong about particular things like the age of the earth and rock layers and dinosaurs, etc. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Mind another the story of an elderly gentleman who was sure his wife was going deaf. So one night he stuck up behind about 10 feet away and he whispered, can you hear me, honey? He heard nothing. He got a few feet closer. Can you hear me, honey? Nothing. He got right behind her. Can you hear me, honey? To which she responded, for the third time, yes. <laughs> the ladies are like, amen. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Wasn't her problem, right? Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And in a very similar way, the evolutionists will dogmatically claim it's the Bible that has a problem, but in reality, it turns out to be their own worldview and their own assumptions that have led them astray. That's really the core issue. And with that in mind, Let me quickly show you where the modern idea of millions of years actually came from, because this can be really helpful to understand what's happening today. We go to this textbook to help us out here. It says that before radiometric dating was available, people estimated the earth was only a few thousand years old. But in the the 1700s, James Hutton. Quick pause. Did you realize that up until about the early 1800s, most scientists believed the Bible and thought the earth was only thousands of years old? It's true. So what did they discover in the early 1800s to change their minds, reject the Bible, and instead believe in millions of years? I'll give you some hints. It was not new rocks or new fossils. They had the same rocks and the same fossils. It wasn't radiometric dating that comes in the early 1900s, and as we'll see here in a bit, is very inconsistent. So what did they find to change their minds? The answer is nothing, at least nothing tangible. What they did find was a new world view, a new way to interpret the same old evidence. Let's keep reading. It says here, in the late 1700s, James Hutton, he estimated the earth was much older. He used the principle of uniformitarianism. Big word, bold print, that will be on the test. All right. (laughs) And this principle states that the earth processes occurring today are similar to those that occurred in the past. In other words, the way things happen today, he assumes, is the way it's always happened in the unseen past. Long, slow, gradual, natural processes only today, well, that's the way it's always been in unseen history. It's a really big assumption, and believe by faith, by the way. He observed that the processes that changed the rocks and land around him were very slow. So he inferred, good word there, could be assumed they've been just as slow throughout Earth's history. He then hypothesized, what's a good word for that? Guessed. Good job. (laughs) Good guess. (laughs) That it took much longer than a few thousand years to form the layers of rock and to erode the mountains. So please notice that Hutton got his conclusion of millions of years not based on any new evidence. Same rocks, same fossils, but a different interpretation based on the assumption of uniformitarianism, that the present is the key to the past. The way things happen now is the way it's always happened. Just long, slow, gradual natural processes only. And that assumption is rooted in the worldview of something called naturalism, materialism, also called atheism, which is a religion by definition, mind you. Remember, we all got faith, just where do you put it? And basically, naturalism says that nature is all that exists and everything can and must be explained with the laws of nature and time and matter alone. And so, please notice, 
that Hudson got his conclusion of millions of years by rejecting biblical authority from the beginning. He assumed no supernatural creation. He assumed no global flood. He assumed the Bible's history was wrong. He had different assumptions, got different conclusions. But his work had a huge influence on a guy named Charles Lyell, who became the father of modern-day geology. And Lyell applied uniformitarianism to geology. And this guy basically argued, you don't need Noah's flood to explain rock layers and fossils and canyons and so forth, although it explains those things really well, by the way. Then he said, we can explain all these geological features with only natural processes. If we just give those processes enough time. And thus was born the modern idea of millions of years. Again, notice, no new evidence. Same stuff, but a different interpretation based on a different worldview. And what was the motivation in this shift away from God's word to man's on this issue? Well, Charles Lael said it well in a letter to a friend that his goal was to free science from Moses. Get God out of science. Because ultimately, as we said this morning, all this stuff, it's not a head issue. It is a heart issue. That then becomes a worldview issue from there. And so we see this real, really this foundational shift starting in the late 1700s. James Hutton's work, his work, caused many to doubt the need for creation roughly 6,000 years ago, just natural processes. And then Lyell's work in the 1800s caused many to doubt the need for a global flood to explain the geology and the paleontology and so forth. And then along comes a guy early 1800s, who was a medical school dropout, and he was forced to go to school by his father to be a clergyman. And this guy, before finishing that, took a trip on a ship called the Beagle to be a naturalist as they toured some islands called the Galapagos Islands. And this guy took with him Lyell's book, Principles of Geology, and he loved the book, and he loved that principle of uniformitarianism. And this guy said, you know what? We can explain all the diversity in life and living things with only natural processes if you give it enough time. Who was that guy? That was Charles Darwin. And he applied it to biology. And many people doubt the need for a creator at all. And guys, from that point in time, there's been this fundamental shift within the scientific community away from God's word to man's on this issue. And nowadays, they interpret all things through a naturalistic, materialistic, essentially atheistic grid. And even many professing Christians who work in those different areas will still operate as functioning atheists as they do those different things within that world because it so dominates that landscape today. And to give you an illustration, this will show you a couple of quick quotes. I can show you thousands of time permitted. But Dr. Scott Todd from Kansas State University said this, that even if all the data pointed to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. It must be naturalistic to be scientific in our culture and our world today. Or Richard Lewontin from Harvard said this. I'll paraphrase it because it's long, but it's really good. He says, not that science compels us to accept materialistic causes. Rather, it's our commitment to materialistic causes that produce materialistic explanations. Note the bottom. This materialism, which you would call naturalism, atheism, this materialism is absolute. Why? We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Not a head issue, it's a heart issue ultimately. And because guys like this write the majority of our science textbooks today, we get quotes like this all the time in different science textbooks, even using some Christian school textbooks, even homeschooling curriculum. Science is restricted to a search for natural causes, for natural phenomenon. Supernatural explanations are simply outside the bounds of science. Why? Because naturalism is the new dominant, hear me, religion of our culture today. Sometimes called secular humanism, naturalism, material, materialism, a religion by definition. By the way, supported by your tax dollars in schools and museums and different things as well. And Hitler said this, or his group said this during Nazi Germany. If you tell a lie loud enough and long enough, the people will start to believe it. And we see this fundamental shift from really late 1700s, early 1800s to what we see today, this fundamental shift away from God's word demands as the authority on this issue. So, dear Christian, we really should not be surprised that secular scientists get such different conclusions about the past. They're starting with radically different starting assumptions. They're starting with only natural processes. We're starting with a supernatural God. No wonder our conclusions are so different. That should not surprise us. But again, 
that naturalistic worldview dominates the scientific community today. They interpret all things through that grid. I'll give you an example of this. I want to show you a clip from this DVD called Check This Out. Good little teaching tool, six mini videos. This one's on radiometric dating. And what I want you to key in on is just how your assumptions will dictate your conclusions. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Check it out. Nearly every textbook in science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating, or radiometric dating. Now this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. Okay, so if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? And that seems like a lot. But let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version of the process. Radiometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay of radioactive elements in them. Basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable and spontaneously decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. Radioisotope dating is commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. It is assumed that once the rock cooled, no more atoms escaped, and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life. That is, the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. Now, of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. But is that all there is to it? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science, because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in the rock sample? How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? The answer is, they don't. Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom, and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand, and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong, because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions. Like, was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Now, of course, there's more to understanding all this, but enough said. Did you get all that? <laughs> I really showed that just to prove somebody talks faster than me. That was the main goal. <laughs> uh, but again, the major point, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions, and the hourglass illustration is a very good one to kind of bring that home. And so with that in mind, bear in mind when someone measures things like radioisotopes, they measure it in the present, not in the past. When do they measure the decay rate? That's done in the present. When do they do their calculations? Done in the present. So they do all this in the present with a set of assumptions about the past. And again, key thing, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. So even if radiometric dating worked perfectly, it would not prove millions of years because of the faulty assumptions that drive its wrong interpretation. But guys, it's anything but perfect. A few quick examples of the inconsistencies of radiometric dating. Part of Mammoth with carbon-14 dating was dated to be 29,000 years, years old. Another part of the same Mammoth was dated to be 44,000 years old. That would be a slow birth. <laughs> Poor Mammoth mother, right? <laughs> Freshly killed seals have been dated with carbon-14 dating over 1,300 years of age. 
and that's observably false for numerous reasons. Or look at other dating methods like potassium argon dating. This one's often used to date igneous rocks, and that is lava flows that have occurred and cooled in the stone. This one's a good one to test. Why? Well, because we know when in history some lava flows, lava flows have occurred when they've cooled and turned to stone. So we can date these rocks, get this, of historical known age to see if the method is somewhat accurate. I could give you literally hundreds of examples, a few now for the sake of time. Rocks that formed in Sicily back in 1972 were dated between 200 and almost 500,000 years of age. Known historical age of the rocks when they were dated was roughly 30. Rocks that formed in New Zealand back in 1954 were dated over 3 million years of age. Known historical age was roughly 50 when they were dated. Rocks that formed in Hawaii back in 1959 were dated between 1 and 15 million years of age. Notice none of those are even close to the actual age of just decades, and they have it in millions or hundreds of thousands. Or who remembers Mount St. Helens erupting back in 1980? Right? A few of you do. They erupted back in 1980. I was three. I remember it well. All right. <laughs> but uh, from that eruption and subsequent eru eruptions, rocks formed from that. They were dated with potassium argon dating to be 340,000 to 2.8 million years old. Now, notice that's a 700% margin of error. And it tells you something else. It tells you if you can remember that event, you are older than you thought you were. <laughs> Actual age was 12 for the rocks when they were dated. And we could literally just go on and on, but these inconsistencies show the inconsistency of the method itself and the inconsistency of those starting assumptions that are anti-biblical at their foundation. And then on top of this, most dating methods, hear me carefully on this, even using the secularist own assumptions of uniformitarianism and naturalism still point to a very young earth, inconsistent with evolutionary thinking, consistent within the biblical time frame. Even using their own assumptions, the evidence points to that biblical timeline. A few quick examples of this. Comets are just big, muddy snowballs out in space. And even the biggest comets with the longest orbits should not last more than 100,000 years. Okay, the question then is why are there literally comets still all over the place? Because according to secular thinking, our solar system formed roughly 5 billion years ago, and that's when the comets formed according to them, and there is no observed source of replenishment. Why are comets still literally everywhere in our solar system? Makes sense in the biblical worldview, that's a challenge for evolutionary thinking. Or issues like this, we are slowly losing the moon by a couple inches per year due to intense tidal friction and stuff like that, it's moving away from us. If it's moving away from us, that means in the past it used to be closer, right? Go back a few thousand years ago, it'd be a tad bit closer than it is today, but would not cause any problems. Go back a few million years ago, theoretically, it would be so close to the earth, it would cause huge tidal changes that would destroy the earth twice a day. I think once would be enough, right? Just leave it at that. And then if we went back about a billion years ago, the moon would run into the earth, which would be catastrophic, of course on numerous levels. Or other observations, like the Earth's magnetic field. We've measured this for now about 150 years, if not more, all around the globe, measured it consistently. By some measures, the best way to date anything on this planet. And so we've noticed it's declined in strength by 10% over the past 150 years. So if it's getting weaker, that means in the past it used to be Strong, right? Go back a few thousand years ago, roughly 6,000 years ago, it'd be roughly 32 times stronger than it is today, which would actually most likely be very beneficial for us in blocking UV light and stuff like that. But keep going back in time due to exponential increase. Just a million years ago, it would be so strong, it would liquefy the earth, which would be bad, or vaporize it rather than liquefy it. Or maybe you've heard that carbon-14 dating proves the Earth is millions of years old. We hear that all the time, right? Ironically, carbon-14 in particular is one of the best confirmations of a young Earth. You say, really? That's really cool. So watch this. So carbon-14 forms in our atmosphere, and carbon-14 is an unstable element. It will change back to nitrogen-14 pretty quickly by radiometric standards. And then here's what happens. Carbon-14 gets absorbed by plants. Animals eat plants, we eat animals and plants, so all living things have some carbon-14 inside of them. And remember, the carbon-14 is unstable. But actually, all of you have some carbon-14 inside of you. 
That means all of you are slightly unstable. <laughs> I see people looking at each other. <laughs> it must be the carbon 14. All right, dude. <laughs> and then here's what happens when a creature dies, it stops taking in carbon 14. And the carbon 14 it does have starts to decay back to nitrogen 14. Now, it decays so quickly that within a hundred thousand years after the creature's death, there should be no detectable carbon 14. None. So anything over 100,000 years of age should have no detectable carbon-14. So this is another really good test. What do we find scientifically again and again and again in pretty much all organic remnants and all the rock layers? We find lots of carbon-14 in all of those remnants from top to bottom. Lots of it. We find carbon-14 in all the major coal seams. We, we find carbon-14 in dinosaur bones literally all the time. We find carbon-14 in diamonds consistently. And that really blows the secularist mind because diamonds are thought to be billions of years old and there's no way to contaminate a diamond. How is carbon-14 still inside? Right answer, just not that old, as implied from scripture. Or look at other observations like how fast deserts grow. We can measure growth rates called the prevailing wind pattern that leads to the growth of a desert. And so we can measure the largest desert in the world's current growth rate. And based on the current growth rate of the Sahara Desert, it looks like the largest desert in the world is roughly 4,000 years old. Now i got a question. Why is the largest desert in the world plausibly 4,000 years old? I've got an idea. I'll come back to it. All right, hold on. Or the Great Barrier Reef over in Australia. Part of it was destroyed back in World War II. Some scientists watched it grow back for 20 years, which had to be boring, all right? But actually, it grew back so quickly to their shock, they said, wow, at this really rapid pace of growth, this entire reef, the largest in the world, could have grown in just 4,200 years. How is that possible? I got an idea. I'll come back to it. Hold on for a second. Or who's seen the sequoias over in California? Awesome, right? Huge trees. This is as close as I get to being a tree hugger, all right, just throwing it out there, all right, but they're really big trees, and they're so big, they have really no natural enemies besides man and really big natural catastrophes, yet even by even the secular's own assumptions, none of these trees are over 4,000 years of age. Why is that? Why do we find carbon-14 and dinosaur bones and in diamonds? Why do we see comets flying around everywhere? Why is the largest desert roughly 4,000 years old? Here's my idea that around 6,000 years ago, God made everything like he says in his word. And roughly 4,400 years ago, there was a global flood that wrecked this world, reset those things. They began to form, like deserts, post Noah's flood, a little over 4,000 years ago. And guys, real science, real observations, real dating methods confirm this again and again and again. And this should not surprise us. Dear Christian, please hear me on this. This is so important. The secularists are wrong. The present is not the key to the past. It is not. You know what it is? God's word, the key to the past, the present, and the future. Only God's word is the only infallible dating method, and we build our thinking from here on every issue. And again, real science will confirm that again and again, but you won't hear much about these, will you? Why? Because they must have their hero to save their theory from contrary evidence. I think what's happened within much of the scientific community can be illustrated nicely by this little analogy of rat poison. Did you realize that rat poison like this is actually 99.995% good food? It is. It's the point zero zero five the rat really should be worried about, right? And guys, in a similar way, there's lots of really good operational science happening in our world today to our blessing, amen? So we have these advances in medication, these advances in technology, that's a blessing for us. But guys, it is the poison of the assumptions of uniformitarianism rooted in the worldview of naturalism that is causing so many to get the wrong conclusions about the unseen past and then to distrust and try to discredit God's word. And let's be fair. I expect, this makes sense, I expect a secular scientist to have a secular worldview. It makes sense that they do. Now, we want them to repent and put their faith in God's word ultimately, but I know why they get that conclusion. But here's the bigger problem. Guys, much of this same poison has crept into the church. That has been catastrophic. 
Let me show you what happened. In the early 1800s, when millions of years became popular in the modern era, many Christian leaders, many Christian theologians around the world, especially in the Western world, uh, I'm assuming with the best of intentions, began to think, well, man, they've proven millions of years, so somehow we have to make the Bible say millions of years because, well, it's proved scientifically. And many theologians at that time began to try to squeeze in the idea of millions of years into God's word. Something you would call eisegesis. And dear Christian, this is how we are to never read the Bible eisegetically. This means to read into. It's to take an idea that's not in the text, but try to squeeze it into the text because you think the text should say that idea. That is eisegesis. And many theologians at that time began to try to reinterpret God's word, clear word, to fit these ideas. And they did it in multiple ways, a few examples. We can't do them all for the sake of time, but I'll give you a few examples. Many began to reinterpret the word day in Genesis. They would probably concede, yes, the context does seem to clearly say six days, but that can't be what it means because of millions of years. So maybe those word, that word day in Genesis really is just referring to a long period of time, different epochs or epochs of time, different eras of time, and day one is millions of years, day two is millions of billions of years, and so forth. And you get something called the day-age theory. And by the way, you'll note pretty much all these old earth ideas started in the early 1800s. Why? That's when millions of years became popular in the cultural context. So many began to try to reinterpret Genesis and say those days were long periods of time. And probably the most quoted verse to support this idea was a verse I quoted for a long time myself when I tried to support this idea, only so. People say, but see, the Bible says that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. Those days in Genesis don't have to be literal days, right? And I would share with them, and I also share with my older self, if I could have a conversation with my older self, Let's first read the rest of the verse here. And a thousand years is like one day. Doesn't that kind of cancel that right out? And then more importantly, what's the context of this verse? This verse is literally all about God's long suffering, waiting for us to repent and put our faith in him. And it's really pointing out how God is not bound by time because he made time, he lives outside of time. It's all about the grandeur and the patience of God and his great salvation. This verse, hear me, literally has nothing to do with the word day, especially I understand it in the book of Genesis, literally nothing. It's not even close. And then here's another question I would ask my older self and those struggling with this today. Why is it that Christians only apply this sort of thinking at days like a thousand years? We only do it to Genesis. We don't ever try to apply this thinking to other biblical events, right? For example, Joshua marched around Jericho for multiple days. A day is like a thousand years, he marched for millions of years. <laughs> like, I'm waiting for the theologian to make that argument. It hasn't happened yet. Or hey, Jonah in the belly of the great fish, there for three days, days like a thousand years, three thousand years, never seen it, I'm still waiting, never seen it. Or a bit more serious here, you're quoting a New Testament verse, so let's apply that thinking to a New Testament event. Jesus died, buried for three days, days like a thousand years, he's still in the tomb. Like, no one ever does that. We only do it in Genesis. Why? I said Jesus. That's why. And there are so many practical problems with this idea of the day-age theory. Here's just one, just for illustration. If those days are long periods of time, well, here's the big issue. God made plants on day three. Here's the problem. The sun was not made until day four. So you got plants living for millions of years without the sun. That would be bad. And then, of course, birds and bees were not made until day five to pollinate the plants. That'd be another period of time they're waiting which again would be bad. And there are a lot more practical problems like that if you want to dive deeper later on on our line or website or so forth. Another popular theory is the gap theory, invented by Thomas Chalmers in the early, again, 1800s. It was included in the Schofield Reference Bible, so it gained a lot of popularity because of that. And so there are many variations of the gap theory. I'll kind of give you just the most traditional one. Uh, of course, we've got whole books and articles online that dive deep into other variations. But the gap theory says this, that you got Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. And the natural reading of the text is that in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. The natural reading is verse 2 describes verse 1. Verse 1, he made it. Verse 2, this is what it looked like. Not two separate events. Made it. This is what it looks like. The gap theory says, no, we don't want like that word was. It should be became. The earth became without void, became without form and void. It got destroyed. 
And this is where they'll try to put the billions of years, and they'll say that Lucifer fell at this particular time, and he corrupted a pre-Adamite race of soulless hominids, that'd be your eight men. And then God sent the Luciferian flood, not Noah's flood, this is a different flood, to destroy the world. That's where he put the millions and billions of years. And then afterwards, you reform and refill the earth. Problems with this are legion. Number one, the word in Hebrew for was is rightly translated as was and should not be became. Number two, all those ideas right there, none of them are in the Bible. Not a one. Also, as a side note, you can make a really strong biblical argument that the devil did not fall until after day seven. And then here's the biggest quick rebuttal to that idea. Again, Exodus 20, 11. For in six days, the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and again, all that is in them in those six days. And then, of course, along comes evolution, and many Christians begin to try to squeeze evolution into the Bible. And for many, they'll say, well, we can just, just add time to the biblical text. It'll make the Bible's history square with evolutionary thinking, right? But guys, nothing could be further from the truth. The order of creation in Genesis contradicts the order of evolution at least 30 different points. They go in actually polar opposite orders. Just adding time to the biblical event of creation doesn't fix this, not at all, not even close. A couple quick examples of this contradiction. The Bible says God made the earth before the sun. Evolution says you got the sun before the earth. The Bible says God made the earth covered in water. Evolution says, no, the earth was a hot rock to begin with. The Bible says God made plants before the sun. Evolution has sun before the plants, and we could just go on and on. But the point of this talk is not to get to the nitty-gritty details of all these old earth ideas. This is more of a big picture. Look at this. Here's a common factor I want you to see in all these old earth ideas, and there are a bunch of them. Whether you're talking about progressive creation, cosmic temple, gap theory, framework hypothesis, there's so many others. Here is their common factor, no matter which old earth idea you're talking about. Their goal is this, to squeeze millions of years into the Bible. That's their common goal. I said Jesus. And then we found another common thing as a ministry as we travel around the world and talk to many pastors and Christian leaders and theologians. Here's a common theme. Most solid theologians and Christian leaders would actually agree that the plain, straightforward reading of the biblical text does say God made all things in six days, roughly 6,000 years ago. They'll agree. That's what the text seems to clearly say in context. But then they'll say this. But that can't be what it means. Guess why? Millions of years, essentially every single time. And if you say, this is what this book clearly says, but that's not what it means, you just said this book contains errors and is fallible. And if you can't trust it here, why trust it anywhere else? And what I want to do right now, I want to show you a few clips, a few quotes from different Christian leaders who are compromised to one degree or another on this issue. And please understand the heartbeat behind showing you these clips and these quotes and so forth. We are not attacking them. I think the guys I'm going to show you, I believe they love God, love his word, love the laws, but they are missing it here. And what we are attacking is a compromised view that's undermining biblical authority that's crept so much into the church. That's what we are dealing with. So please understand the heartbeat behind showing you these. First quote here is from Dr. Norman Geiser, who did many great things for the kingdom of God about that, but he missed it here on numerous levels. Talking about the age of the earth, he said, the problem is deepened by the fact there is a prima facial evidence that indicates the earth or the days in Genesis are 24-hour periods. So basically the text says those are 24-hour days. But most scientific evidence says the earth is billions of years old, and he would lean more towards that as opposed to the first idea. Or Dr. William Lane Craig, you probably know that name, a very famous apologist who's been around for quite a while now, and he has done some good things for the kingdom in the past, no doubt, but he is so off here. Listen to what he says uh, back in 2009 on this issue. How old is the world? The best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now this is good, you see. I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science in okay. presenting these arguments. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics uh, supports. He's going with the flow of a secular interpretation of present-day 
observations rooted in man's word instead of God's, whether he realizes that or not, which is the fundamental issue. But he's compromised Genesis from the beginning, so I want you to see how he, now, how he now views Genesis as he's kind of dismissed it as history. He's got a new book. He came out about a year ago on Adam, which basically embraces all of evolutionary thinking, just says God did it, essentially. Uh, but listen to his view of Genesis now at this point, 12 years later in 2021. I think it should prompt us not to be over-literalistic in the way we read these narratives. And once you begin to look at them in terms of mytho-history, it's difficult to look at them in any other way. Mm. I mean, when you read a story about two people in an arboretum with these magical trees whose fruit, if you eat it, will grant you immortality or knowledge of good and evil, and then there's this talking snake who comes along and tempts them into sin. And then you have this anthropomorphic God walking in the cool of the garden. I can't take any more. <laughs> but notice just the mocking of the straightforward history of Genesis. And by the way, what he's mocking is what Jesus believes as recorded in God's word. What every biblical author says is real history, he is mocking because this influence of secular thinking to try to reinterpret Genesis to get in line with the secular ideologues of our day. So if it's all just mytho history, as he says, how does he interpret Genesis? Well, here's a little clip. We'll do more of this tomorrow, but here you go. Now, uh, assuming then, for the sake of argument, the truth of evolutionary biology uh, okay. concerning human origins, we can imagine sometime prior to 750,000 years ago, a group of hominins, uh, maybe a a few thousand, and through a biological and spiritual renovation, perhaps divinely induced, a, a miracle that caused a genetic regulatory mutation in a pair of these hominins, they were lifted to fully human status and capable uh, of Sounds just like Genesis, doesn't it? Or maybe you know the name, Pastor Tim Keller, very well-known pastor, and he utterly rejects the clear history of Genesis. Here's a quick quote, a quote from a conference he was speaking at, just a quick synopsis of his view. If you are upset by what I just said, don't be upset. I'm not trying to convince you that creation science isn't true. I don't, I don't believe the earth is young, and I don't believe that, the, I don't think the Bible teaches that. I don't believe in a worldwide flood. I don't think the Bible teaches that. I think the Bible would disagree with him. Or this one, John Walton. You may not recognize the name John Walton. He wrote the book, The Lost World of Genesis, but he's got a huge influence on the textbooks written for Bible colleges and seminaries. And here's a, here's a clip of him being uh, interviewed by Biologos, which is a theistic evolutionist think tank, which is very unbiblical at their core as far as their understanding of Genesis. But listen to what he says here. In my book, I've tried to show that the the account in Genesis 1 is not intended to be an account of material origins. If that's so, the Bible has no narrative of material origins. And if that's so, then we don't have to defend the Bible's narrative of material origins against a, a scientific narrative because the Bible doesn't offer one. In that case, we can say, well, if the Bible doesn't offer us a narrative, we can look to science for the narrative. If that history in Genesis is not real history, I got some questions. Where do we come from? Where does sin and death come from? Why is death the consequence for sin? Why is Jesus called the last Adam if there was not a first Adam? Um, why does every biblical author and Jesus himself refer to Genesis 1 to 11 as real history consistently, repetitively, unequivocally? The theological dominoes fall really quickly when you give it the foundational history starting in Genesis. A couple more will wrap up. Maybe you heard the name John Piper, a very well-known pastor. Of course, he's done many great things for the kingdom and that about that, but he's missing it here. Or he might take Salehammer's view, which is where I uh, feel at home, namely that what's going on here is all of creation happened uh, to prepare the land for man in, in the first one, beginning, he made the heavens and the earth, that's everything. And then you go day by day and he's preparing the land. He's not bringing new things into existence 
He's preparing the land and causing things to grow and separating out water and earth. And then when it's all set and prepared, he creates and puts man there. And so that, that has the advantage of saying that the earth is billions of years old if it wants to be. Whatever science says it is, it is. Uh, whatever, whatever science says it is, it is. But guys, science does not speak. Scientists speak as they interpret present day observations with their assumptions about the past. I think he really encapsulates what's, why so many Christian leaders and pastors are missing it here. They're conflating or confusing historical science with operational science, not understanding the distinct difference and the role your worldview plays in your interpretations when you try to make guesses about the past. And I'll give you one last one. We'll be wrapping up for tonight. You may have recognized the name uh, Andy Stanley, a very well-known pastor in the Georgia area, has a pretty big church of like 30,000 people or something has a really big influence on pastors as well. And he did a whole series of sermons a while back uh, called Who Needs God? Really reaching out to the younger generations and trying to appeal to them. And um, basically, we're going to see here, how he's, he basically says you can embrace these ideas. And you'll see his conclusions here in a moment. I will say this up front. I did watch all six sermons of this series. I watched them all. I took copious notes. These clips are in context. Here they are. We really believe, whether you take it literally or figuratively, whatever, if we really believe that God is the creator of the universe, that all time, space, and matter, all time, space, and matter were created by God, and we take seriously what science has told us, that it all began with a singularity, that's what it's referred to, right before, there's not such thing as before the Big Bang, because before is time, and time began. So if we go to the singularity that was the Big Bang, that unfurled the universe, that continues to expand. First, he talks faster than me. <laughs> that's impressive, all right? <laughs> But then note, he's basically saying you can embrace the Big Bang, squeeze it into the Bible, then he goes on to say this. And the moment your theology conflict, conflicts with the discoveries of science, you have a theological problem, not a science problem. Now, your response is the typical one, and it is the right one, but can I encourage you to think about it this way? He just said what all the other guys said before him. He just said it a bit more bluntly, but it's the same thing. And guys, in summary here, the text and grammatical structure of Genesis does not allow for millions of years. The evidence rightly understood does not allow for millions of years. And then most importantly of all, as we mentioned this morning, we'll summarize it now, the Bible's theology and the gospel indirectly doesn't allow for millions of years. Because as we mentioned, the Bible is clear that God made this world perfect. It was man's sin that brought death, the enemy, into God's perfect creation. But if you try to put millions of years into the Bible, no matter how you try, no matter how good your intentions might be, inevitably you'll put death before sin, which is theologically impossible. You see, the Bible tells us this, God made it perfect, man sin, wrecked creation, then Noah's flood laid down most of the rock layers and fossils we see today, which is a great explanation for what we actually do find. But if you reject this, what are you left with? Well, man's ideas. And the supposed evidence for the millions of years are all those rock layers that were supposedly laid down over long periods of time, think about it, long before man ever existed, and thus before sin. So if you embrace this, you got all these rock layers before man and before sin, these rock layers full of death, bloodshed, disease, brokenness. So by embracing that, you're embracing death before sin. And again, as we mentioned this morning, in short summary, if there was death before sin, that would mean death is not the consequence or payment for sin. It's just always been around. Part of God's very good creation. He's the author of it. And if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death cannot and does not pay our sin debt. And that is unbiblical in the highest degree, but if that were the case, that would make this event in history unnecessary. And of course, we all would agree, I hope, that that is unbiblical in the highest degree. And guys, this is why we care. Defending biblical authority from the beginning and the gospel rooted in that authority. And please hear me on this. I'm sure that maybe many of you, like myself, for the longest time, had the best of intentions when I try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible and say, don't worry about it, just trust in Jesus. We have really good intentions. But again, you can have great intentions, but get horrible consequences. We'll wrap up with a little story. Go a few minutes over since it's only one talk tonight. Story to illustrate the point. True story. About maybe 20 years ago now, it's been a while, I was a um, 20, oh wait, 8, 13 teaching. Wow, 
24 years ago. Anyway, when I was a child care director just for a little bit at the YMCA. Um, one day I came into the building, the kids were there, and uh, they said, they were all excited to see me. Hey, Mr. Osborne. I'm like, hey, guys. And I kind of realized I didn't have a good relationship with these kids. I thought, I need to bond with these kids. What can we do? So I decided, let's take all the kids to the park. And while we're at the park, I'll try to play with the kids, build relationships, and so forth. So I said, let's go to the park. Everybody's like, yay. So we jump in the van, counselors, me, with the kids, go to the park. When we get there, the kids fan out on the playground. And then some kids see a merry-go-round. And they see me. They say, hey, Mr. Osborne, will you push us on the merry-go-round? I thought, perfect. Came to bond with kids. Yeah, I jump on there. So they jump on. I start pushing the merry-go-round. And, of course, what are the first words out of their mouth? Or mouths. Yeah, faster, right? And bear in mind, this was 23 years ago or so. So this is back in the day. There were no governors on the merry-go-rounds. These were real manly merry-go-rounds, all right? And so I'm pushing it faster and faster, and they were giggling for a while. Then eventually they got quiet, hanging on for dear life. That's just for fun. But in reality, what they had actually done, this is a true story, by the way, they had worked their ways into the inner bars of the merry-go-round to hold the inner bars so they could hang on tight. You guys remember doing that? So that's what they were doing. And so as I'm pushing the merry-go-round, something clicks inside of me, I guess just because I'm a man. My motivation shifted from bonding with these kids to how fast can I make this thing go? <laughs> true story. I started giving that merry-go-round everything I had. <laughs> and after a couple of minutes, I took a step back. I admired my work. I thought, that's impressive. That thing was moving. And then a thought hit me. Can you spin this fast enough to where the force of the spin would suck the kids out of the merry-go-round? No sooner had I thought that, true story, one kid begins to lose his grip, and he shoots out of the merry-go-round. As he's coming out, it gets worse. As he's coming out, the bar hits him on the head on the way out. And he's spinning like a helicopter top towards my knees. I jump over this poor kid. Right? I look back. He skips on the ground like a rock on water. Doom, 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 doom. One kid shoots out this way, hits the ground, hits a tree. There's like one left. And so I think I got to save the last one, right? So I, I throw my hands into the merry go round to stop it from spinning. Da -da 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 wow, thanks. <laughs> It stops, and I take just one quick second just to gather my wits, right? And I think to myself, all right, that's it. I've had a good run. <laughs> I'm going to jail. <laughs> I've just killed two kids. There's no way they're okay. And so I ran to check on the kids. The one kid who was in the merry ground was crying, but they were okay crying. But I check on the other two kids, and uh, when I check on them, I learned just two really big important things that day. Number one, Kids are amazingly tough. Amen, parents? The kids were okay. Now, the one kid had a big old knot on his head, as you might imagine, from the metal bar clanking him on the way out. But he was okay. The other kid was fine, too. A bit scraped up, but they were okay. So I learned kids are tough. Second thing I learned was this. You can have some really good intentions and still give some horrific consequences. And guys, in a real sense, I think we have an eisegesis problem in much of the church probably with the best of intentions, right? People think, oh, well, they've proven this, therefore I've got to make the Bible say this. People believe the Bible. I'm going to assume that's their intentions. But you're undermining biblical authority and the gospel you hope to proclaim for their salvation. Best intentions versus consequences. So rather than do that, let us stand on God's word. Let us not add to or take away from God's word. His word is pure. If you try to add or take away, he'll rebuke you. Let us say with Joshua, we will serve our Lord me and my house will serve the Lord. His word will be our authority. We'll stand on that foundation. We'll defend our faith rooted in his word. We'll take every thought captive, make it obedient to Christ. And as we do, we've got answers. And we can use these answers to defend the faith, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ effectively to a lost and dying world. And to equip our kids to stand firm and be the salt and light God has called and commanded them to be. And again, that's what this is all about. If you want to dive deeper in this, we are... Even going an hour and five minutes, we are flying over this. I try to talk not too fast. I'm trying to cover a lot of stuff, though. If you want to dive deeper on any of these different angles on the age of the earth, you can go to our website, answersingenesis.org. It has literally hundreds or thousands of articles on this issue, videos for free. I mean, you could spend millions of years on the website looking at that stuff, all right? So, okay. 
And then you got these two specials or three specials going on. You had these five books, any, any, these five for 70. Answers book one will deal a lot with the issues of the age of the earth and things like carbon-14 dating and stuff like that. And then the kids' books, the 10 for 70 as well, the Answers for Kids deal a lot with these issues of, again, age of the earth, dinosaurs, are related to that in a different way, but that's all in there as well. You can get the whole set, all 15 for 125, which is a wonderful deal. I encourage you to check that out. And remember, you can sub in my book, Quick Answers to Tough Questions, or Quick Answers to Social Issues, either one. You can sub in those two books for any of those special books on the other deals. Or you can buy my two books for two for 20, just on their own. That's a special deal for you guys, or just swap them in and out. And the first book on Quick Answers to Tough Questions, I give answers about the age of the earth, carbon-14 dating, why it matters, theologically, death before sin issue. We talk about all that in short, concise, rapid format. So it's very ADD-friendly. Again, it's good for ages 9 to 90, so it's helpful on that. And then also our magazine, I will so encourage you to check out our magazine. It does come out quarterly. It's 80-some pages long. It deals with all sorts of issues from a biblical worldview perspective. This is great for your home, office, classroom, Sunday school classroom, with your kids, for yourself, so much good stuff in there. And there's a separate kids magazine, and my son, who's now eight, really does, he loves it. My daughter, Macy, who's four, she's really loving it as well. It's so well done, 30 pages for the kids, activities, good teaching, uh, good biblical teaching, on so many different things. And there's also a digital magazine you get with the subscription that you can go online, read the whole thing. You can actually have the articles read to you, which is kind of a nice feature if you want that. All that's available just with a one subscription for the magazine. Check that out over the book table. If you want to sign up for our newsletter, AnswersInsider.com. That's our newsletter. comes out monthly. God's doing stuff literally around the globe through Answers in Genesis. And you want to keep up with that, sign up for that, check that out. And then if you want all of our DVDs, if you want all of our videos on radiometric dating and the age of the earth and the rock layers and the fossils and dinosaurs in the Bible and evolution and all this stuff, there's over 5,000 videos on our platform, Answers.tv. It's our streaming platform. There's so much stuff on there. We stream our conferences on there, live shows like Answers News, which is a weekly commentary on the kind of the news issues of our day from a biblical perspective. It's only 40 bucks for the entire year for that thing. It's a really great deal. So good. Basically, parents and grandparents, your kids can go to that, click it on. No matter what they watch, it'll be edifying and glorifying to God. Unlike when you have Disney Plus or Netflix or Hulu or whatever. Just throwing that out there. And then also, I mentioned before, we are hiring. If you're interested in coming to work, we'd love to have you. we got so many spots. We employ roughly 700 to 800 people full-time at the ministry, between the attractions, the Ark Encounter, and the Creation Museum, uh, and then, of course, all the other logistics, like speakers and myself. We have roughly 1,400-ish total employees there in peak seasonal times. And so we need people. And so if you are wanting to be a part of this, Go to answersandgenesis.org, backslash jobs, we'd love to have you. We need people to help with what's coming, too. Really quickly, just throwing this out there. These are brand new slides to me, by the way. I love seeing this. So each year, we, we are seeking to grow every single year and keep expanding the ministry. And so basically, when we look at our ministry, we have over a million people coming through the Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum. Uh, we know roughly over 500,000 of those are not saved. So they're hearing the gospel and the truth of God's word. There's a major impact there. And basically, the money made through revenue brought in by the attractions is what supports the just logistics of the ministry to keep it running. But if you want to do anything more, you have to fundraise to make that happen. And so this year, our main focus is going to be this. If you've been to the Arkham County, you recognize this. We want to keep building and have this brand new uh, Jerusalem City model that's going to be part of the um, exhibits and part of the attraction as you go to the Arkham County. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be, so you got the bus coming up here. By the way, I'm going to walk through this video with you. It's like the second time I've seen it, all right? So you see you have this building right here. That's where the building is going to be. Brand new expansion. The buses will drop off right there in front of there. You see the ark in the background. It'll walk you through first century Israel. We'll have the largest uh, Jerusalem model in the entire world uh, enhanced by our artists. It's going to be absolutely incredible. So that's what it's going to look like, Lord willing. So we're raising for that right now within the ministry. And so it's going to be epic. There's the inside view. If you've been to the Ark Encounter, Answer Center is on your left, and then you have this building right here. There you go. That's what it's going to actually look like. And if you're like me, you cannot wait to see this. It's going to be epic. It's going to be awesome. And our artists are so gifted in what they do, and they research so hard to get it right. And so you, you will love this, and I think it's something we all would want to support. So you can check it out. You can scan the barcode actually on the right there if you're interested in that. Also, Richard Smith, who's over there, all right, he's part of the advancement team for our ministry. He's located here in Raleigh. He would love to hang out and chat with you guys. If you're interested in, like, how can I get involved in this, you can talk with him. He'll know more of the nuts and bolts of it. But it's going to be an awesome thing. That's the next big thing coming for us. And then, by the way, it doesn't stop there. We have plans, Lord willing, to build a children's museum, which is going to be awesome. And then also a Tower of Babel, which will be later down the road as well. 
People ask, when will that be finished? We say, we don't know. The first one never was. So we're not sure about... <laughs> but uh, we're doing an end-of-year challenge right now with an amazing fundraising goal. We have someone dedicated to matching money donations up to $20 million. If you want to be part of that, you can check out, talk to Richard. He knows the details on that. We'd love to have you involved in that. And God's just so great, so uh, powerful, and he's so full of grace and mercy towards us and actually providing our needs to keep us growing as a ministry, to keep bringing people to hear the truth of God's word in amazing, unique ways, to challenge them with this truth right in front of their eyes in an amazing, unique way, engage them truth in the gospel. And we see people getting saved and God doing awesome things. And so if you got questions about anything, we had the one main session tonight. You hung in there really well. Uh, questions about radiometric dating, age of the earth, you want to talk about distant starlight, whatever, come on, chat with me. I'd be glad to hang out and talk with you guys for all night. That'd be fine with me. Come on, chat. If you, want to think, if you think of something later, you can find me in particular on Facebook, and you can send me a message there, and I'd be glad to respond to that. But please understand the heartbeat of this is not simply to give an answer about these things, but to defend the faith, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ for his glory. Amen? Amen. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your creation. Lord, we thank you for the fact that we can trust all that your word says, that your word is literally the revelation of reality. God, help each one of us to stand on that revelation, to indeed obey that command to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And Lord, that we will contend earnestly for the faith. And God, that we will contend, not to be contentious, but we will contend because we want to glorify you and love you and exalt you through obedience. And also we would hope and pray that as we are obedient, you would work through us and through your word and through the gospel to change hearts and lives, to save people for your glory. Because, Lord, we recognize that the ultimate answer to the issues of our world and our culture, the answer is the gospel. It is your truth and your spirit and your power. Your word says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Lord, you change hearts and minds. May we be faithful to obey your word, defend the faith, proclaim the good news of Christ, and watch you work for your glory. And then we can celebrate for eternity on what you do now. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We'll give Brian a big hand. Thank him for his presentation. Thank you. That concludes this session tonight. Tomorrow we'll be back at 6 o'clock for two sessions back-to-back. -back. I hope you'll come back tomorrow night. Have a good night. God bless you.